So on the topic of evolution, let's start off talking about different habitats plants live in, their adaptations, and also all the different life forms plants display. When we talk about the environment of a plant, we can refer to a number of different things. The macro environment is the larger scale. Micro environment is that very close to the individual organism as experienced, you know, at the borders of the organism. Habitat is a word we use to describe all the conditions of a particular place that an individual lives or a population lives or a community. And every habitat has a characteristic community, species that have a variety of life forms and ways of making a living. In any region, there can be multiple habitats and a bunch of different plant communities. And the word vegetation is used to describe all the plant communities of a given region. Flora is a word that's more taxonomically oriented. It's all of the plant species in a given region. The term life form can be loosely translated as different ways of making a living for a plant. Life forms are differ in terms of the lifespan of the individual, the size and degree of secondary growth or woodiness, and how independent the plants are. So for lifespan, if a plant lives a year, reproduces, and dies, it's called an annual. If it lives and reproduces through its lifetime many times, it's called a perennial then the word biennial means it takes two years of growth to reach reproductive size, then it flowers and dies. In terms of size, plants are categorized as herbs, shrubs, trees, vines, and lianas. Herbaceous plants are those that display no obvious secondary growth. Shrubs are woody plants and the definitions differ. My rule of thumb is anything that branches a, b below a meter from the ground. A tree branches more than a meter from the ground. A woody plant. Woody means they have secondary growth. A vine, we use that term for herbaceous vines with green stems, and liana for woody vines. The normal state for a plant is to be photosynthetic, self-feeding, and rooted in the ground, but there are different alternatives. Plants might be parasitic, depending on other plants for their um, glucose. They might be hemiparasites, partly photosynthetic, partly parasitic, and if they sit on another plant, they're called epiphytes, and epiphytes are not, by definition, parasitic. And saprophytes are those that grow on dead material. If the morphology of a plant is unusual, that's part of its life form. It might be spinescent, having sharp points in the form of a rosette with all of the leaves arranged around the base of the stem. It might be a succulent plant, either having succulent leaves or stem. And if a plant is super pubescent, that's worth noting. And leaf traits also can be used to describe morphology and life forms. If plants have very tough leaves, they're called sclerophylls. The tough leaves are sclerophylls, or these are sclerophyllous plants. Evergreen plants keep their leaves for more than a year, sometimes three years to five years or longer. They replace their leaves, but at a very uh, slow rate. Needle leaves are like we see on pine trees and other gymnosperms, very reduced, only like a midrib. A broadleaf plant is a typical plant leaf. 
floating leaves on the surface of the water. Leaves may be dissected, especially those that are under the water. And in the case of carnivorous plants, leaves can have special adaptations to let them get nutrition from insects, insectivorous plants. Finally, phenology can fit into life form, and depending on which time of the year the plant lives and dies, plants may be classified in the Mediterranean climate as a winter or a summer annual. Many plants in temperate regions are winter deciduous when it's cold outside, and then in seasonal climates, wet, dry seasonal climates, many plants lose their leaves when it's dry and they're drought deciduous. The Danish botanist Kristin Ronquier made a system of life form classification based on the location of the perinating buds. In 1900, he went to the Virgin Islands to convalesce from tuberculosis, and he was struck by the difference in life forms compared to his home in Denmark. The largest group were the large woody plants, the phanerophytes, with renewal buds well above the ground. Megaphanerophytes got very tall, more than 30 meters tall. Mesophanerophytes from 8 meters to 30 meters. Microphanerophytes, 2 meters to 8 meters, still kind of big, 6 feet or taller. And then nanophanerophytes, those that grow close to the surface of the ground from 25 centimeters to 2 meters. So all of these phanerophytes are mostly plants of favorable environments, which don't have freezing. So other categories based on the position of the new renewal buds are chemophytes with renewal buds at or very near the soil surface, above the soil surface, hemicryptophytes with buds hidden in the soil right at the surface, cryptophytes with those renewal buds buried, and then something he called therophytes, ephemeral, which are plants that die and are gone, and their renewal buds are in their seeds, like desert annuals. He also recognized succulents, stem succulents, and epiphytes in his classifications. He used these classifications to compare different parts of the world, and he generated what he called normal for the world by taking a hundred species at random from Index Cuensis, which is a list of all the plant species known at that time in the world. And you can see that less than half of the plants are phanerophytes in the normal for world, and Hemicryptophytes are the other big category. But then if we look at different extremes in climate, the Seychelles, islands, tropical, have a predominance of phanerophytes and fewer hemicryptophytes. Death Valley, um, you know, desert environment, shows a surplus of therophytes, those that have renewal buds in the seeds. Denmark, a place which is very seasonal and cold in the winter, has a hemicryptophyte surplus. Most of the plants with renewal buds very close to the surface of the ground. And then Spitsbergen, high and low, um, even colder, has a chemophyte surplus more than um, normal for the world where the where the buds are right at the surface of the ground. So in these extreme cold places toward the poles or very high elevation places with a lot of snow on the ground, there's a chemophyte surplus. And this is a situation you might say, well, the buds might freeze, but the buds are actually covered with snow which can insulate them during the coldest parts of the winter. 
The wet tropics are those places that show a predominance of phanerophytes, woody plants, more than the normal. In the subtropics, especially dry or seasonal places, there's a therophyte surplus plants that perinate only in their seed. And in the temperate deciduous forests, there's a lot of hemicryptophytes, those which have their renewal buds at the surface or slightly under the surface of the ground. And last of all, a chemophyte surplus in the tundra. So let's take those categories and look at our local habitats. In the Pinelands, in a, this place where we have long, wet, hot summers, there is a predominance of sclerophyllous shrubs. And these many of the plants are fire adapted. Their leaves make good fuel. And then many re-sprout, although some may reseed. And these plants are classified as micro and nano phanerophytes, all pretty short, not many more than six feet or uh, 15 feet tall. In the hardwood hammocks, usually these places are protected from fire. There is a phanerophyte surplus, but because of our dry season, many of these lose their leaves in the winter. In the sawgrass prairie, what we might call the glade habitat, it's a perennial sedge land with sawgrass and other grasses. These plants are seasonally inundated, covered with water, and periodically burned. So we find a lot of therophytes. This is a habitat where we have the most annuals, and hemicryptophytes, as well as bulbs that perinate under the ground, cryptophytes. So other extreme habitats, you can come up with these yourselves, but in the desert, many of the perennial plants are spiny or hairy, barrel-shaped, found in some cacti and other plants, that is, stem succulents, and also many therophytes, things that perinate as a seed. In the tropical rainforest, many plants have long-lived leaves. There's lots of water there. And because plants might easily tip over, a lot of trees have buttressed stems and are often have branches covered with epiphytes. And of course, a phanerophyte surplus since it's a non-freezing sort of environment. In the cloud forest, in the higher parts of tropical mountains, there are more drastic differences seasonally and between day and night, and leaves in the cloud forest are tougher than tropic, on tropical rainforest plants. One really interesting convergence is that people thought it, epiphytes were mostly a phenomenon of tropical rainforest, but it turns out in temperate rainforests there are many epiphytes as well. And in both places there's a phenomenon called canopy root formation, where trees put out adventitious roots from their branches into the masses of epiphytes or organic matter on their branches to take up nutrients. In the Olympic rainforest in the Ho Valley, Washington State, three of the seven major tree species have canopy roots. And in the Monteverde cloud forest, many more tree species present and 22 of them have canopy roots.